I want you, if you will, to turn to the book of Galatians. And I'm going to share. I don't know how far we'll go today. I, I plan on going through the whole book. And let me talk a little bit about Galatians. First of all, Galatians is kind of a mini Romans. And this was written, written, really, written to the churches in Galatia. Now, Paul founded these churches. And it's, there's some debate. Was it the first or the third missionary journey? Was it 49 A.D.? Was it 59 A.D.? Really don't know for sure, but it really doesn't matter. The Galatians, this area of Galatia, was not a church. It was a group of churches. This was a Roman province, and it was started, it was organized in 25 B.C., so it was a, it was a real, uh, it was a political center, and it was a geographical area. Well, there was a problem. Something had happened from where they started. We don't believe that uh, the Jerusalem Council had taken place yet. And if you don't know what that is, it's in Acts chapter 15. And we believe that it was convened shortly after this based on what Paul was telling these churches in Galatia. And as it began to take place, this, this uh, Jerusalem Council, things began to change. It was salvation by grace through faith. Before it was it was salvation with grace mixed with works. And folks, that's not grace. And I'm afraid that's a lot of what's being taught today. And there was a question, how can men, sinful by nature, come to God and holy by nature? And people will say, well, it's all God. It's all God. And, and they'll talk about, you must repent. Okay. Well, I agree with repentance. Repentance does come. But repentance is a byproduct of what God has already done and you believing it. Now, here's what people teach about repentance today. When you repent, then God will do something. And folks, that makes it works. That makes it what you do rather than what God has done. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws man to repentance. In repentance, people have the idea that's a changing of action, and it is. It leads to that. But repentance is not a changing of action. Repentance is a changing of the mind. The Bible says, so a man thinks, so is he. It's a changing of the mind. you saying, Lord, you mean you have included me in yourself? You mean you have given me your life? You have done all these things for me all of it was done before time existed before the foundation of the world the universe the cosmos that's what that means we're not talking earth we're talking the cosmos before anything was created you've already chosen me and in love before anything was created this is ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 and 5 and in love you predestined me as adoption to adoption as a son before I did anything, before I was even born, before you created anything in your mind, you'd already done that. And you believe it. And you realize that there's a God and He loves me unconditionally. And it changes the way I think. Now, the main theme of the book of Galatians, the main theme, is the doctrine of justification by faith plus nothing. Now, most of you would say, yep, that's right. The doctrine of the justification by faith plus nothing. But here's where we mess up. We think the faith is ours. But here's the problem. You don't have any until God gave you his faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift. What's a gift? I used to think grace was a gift. Faith, grace was God's part. Faith was my part. And when the two came together, salvation takes place. That's just not what the Bible says. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not a result of works that any man should boast. And in, Gal in Galatians 2.16, and we'll get there. I'm not going to go over to it today. I'm going to fight the, res the, the urge to go there today. 
but it says it's not the works of the law that that lead to justification but it is the faith and the king james translates this right i'm not saying the king james always gets things right and i'm not trying to correct quote unquote what you perceive as the bible by the way we only have translations today we don't have any autographs autographs were the original but i am telling you what the greek says we're not justified by the works that are owned by the law but we are justified by the faith that is owned by Jesus Christ. It's the faith of Christ that leads to justification, not yours. Now, it becomes yours because you believe it. You receive it. Now, it was yours already. You just weren't benefiting from it because you didn't believe it or you didn't know it. Jesus said this, this is eternal life, that you may know the Father and basically Jesus whom he sent. It's not about doing, it's about knowing what he has done. So there we are. Paul was thought of as a Johnny come lately. Do y'all say that up in the north? Do y'all say that? I don't know, if you say it in England, do you say it in England, Johnny come lately? You probably been. Not, not, not. Johnny, Johnny come lately, that means he's a newbie, you know? He's a newbie. Paul was looked at as a newbie. Not only was he not among the original apostles. Man, the first part of Paul's quote-unquote ministry, his job was to track down, kill, and torment Christians. He wasn't a good guy. Until that day that he was on his way to Damascus. And, and I have this message called the day that Jesus knocked Paul off his high horse. You ever heard the old saying, he's up on, you're on your high horse. You need to get off your high horse. And we usually mean it as a put down. But what it was, when literally God knocked Jesus, I mean, uh, Paul, Saul at the time, off his high horse. And he saw him and he heard him. Nobody else knew what was going on. They heard a sound, didn't know what it was. And Paul said, who art thou? Can you just say hear him saying that? He speaks King James. Who art thou, Lord? <laughs> he asked the question and answered it at the same time. And Jesus told him, he said, it's hard to kick against the goads, isn't it? It's hard to go against what you know down deep is truth. Well, there he was. And from that time on, things changed. Well, we're going to start in verse 1. The letter of Paul to the Galatians. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Well, I want you to see that Paul literally was not sent from men. His apostleship was not from men. But his apostleship was through Christ the Son and God the Father whom God raised from the dead. You know what we're talking about right here? His apostleship was the gospel to share the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, who it was for and what it did. Folks, you've got that same mandate. So do I. What do we do? We don't tell people anymore what we need to do. We tell people what Christ has already done. And then we encourage them to believe it. Last night I was talking to these, these old friends that hadn't been around in a long time. In fact, I actually used to be their pastor. And uh, folks, tragically, I preached a different message 30 years ago. I was never what you call a beat you up pastor. I never was. But there were things that I just did not understand. I was a grace guy even then, but I did not understand the scope, the far reaching scope of the grace of God for all men. I didn't realize it. And I'm talking to these people and man, they're, they're tracking following right along and I'm thinking what has happened and you know what well God shared it with me who am I to think that he couldn't be sharing it with somebody else sometimes you don't even know what it is you're missing you just know there's something missing not from God's side but from what I'm seeing so man they got excited and I got excited the more they got excited the more I got excited I was in Peru Lima some years ago and uh and I had three days I was going to be sharing in this church. Three days. 
And it was one of the largest churches in Lima, if not the largest, certainly one of the largest. And uh, I don't know how we got in there. People ask me, how do you get those places? I have no idea. I had nothing to do with it. All I did was show up. That's just how I like it, to be quite honest about it. And there we were, and I thought, you know, I've got three days. And so I'm just going to go through the book of Galatians in three days. That's what I did. Preached through the book of Galatians for those three days. Now, I want to say there were things that I did not see then that I see now. And if I waited a few more years, I'll come back to the book of Galatians and say, how did I miss that? But God did such a work in that church through this book. And all I would do is just share these verses and talk about them and keep my finger on the verse. Then I would ask them, does it say this? And they would, the heads would all nod. Yes, it does. Well, the last day, Sunday, we were getting ready to preach. And uh, Gerardo Vasquez, who I was with, we had already decided the night before we had a trip scheduled for the fall. This was in May, and we had a trip scheduled in the fall to go to uh, back. We'd been there many times, wound up going there seven times back to Argentina in the fall. And so Gerardo and I had decided that we were going to postpone the trip to Argentina. We're coming back to Lima in the fall because I knew it was not finished. And uh, we hadn't said anything to anybody. And I think we were going to come back in September. That's when we had decided to do it. And so we were sitting there and the pastor was talking about us. And sometimes I didn't good. I mean, sometimes they try to correct what you've said. This guy wasn't doing that. This guy stood up and he was a really sharp, articulate, distinguished, uh, good guy with a very large church. And he stood up before his people and he said, I want to apologize to you. He said, I have been preaching lie. This was, you went with me the second time. This was the first time we were there. So you saw what it was the second time. You know I'm not exaggerating. But Arthur and I looked at each other. I, as far as I know, that may be the first time that I'd ever heard a pastor stand up and say that. And he said, I'm bringing these guys back in September. I looked at Gerardo, he looked at me. We looked at the pastor and we go, oh, okay. He didn't know that God had already told us the same thing. We're going to go back and we're going to continue, pick up where we left off. So that's the way God does things. And he's doing that with you. You're going to tell people. Now his son's a pastor now, his son's, I, 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 I tell people sometimes, it's just disgusting. Kind of like the, the son of my friend. This guy's son too, he looks like that too. I mean, you know, he's tall, handsome, talented, smart. I really don't like the guy. No, I'm just teasing. I mean, you know, you just hate for one guy to get all of that, but he did. But uh, now the son, he's involved in this. He's my friend on Facebook. And, and they're, who knows, they may be watching this. But it's so exciting to see these things happen apart from anything you did. And that's the same thing that's going on in this country and around the world right now. Well, Paul wasn't sent from men, nor the agency of men. He didn't have some organization funding him or sending him. But through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Okay. And he said, and all the brethren who are with me. Now, there are, there are people that are traveling with Paul right now. And he's writing to the church at Galatia. Now, some people say he may have written this from Ephesus. And he may have. Good chance that's where it was written, but it's okay. doesn't matter wherever it was written. And here's his message. And it starts here. He pretty much summed up the whole book in the first five verses. He said, grace to you. That's where it starts. Grace to you. Who's that for? That's for everybody. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to say this. Grace has a name. His name is Jesus. Peace has a name. His name is Jesus but it's from the Father and the Son. Some people wrongly have the idea that Jesus loves you, for the Bible tells me so. You know the song, and I love the song, but the Father, the Father's a God of wrath. And if you don't do right, He's gonna pour it out on you, not understanding what wrath is. 
Wrath literally means strong emotion. You know, he pours it out on everybody. What is his nature? The nature of God is love. The nature of God the Father is love. The nature of Christ the Son is love. Jesus said, if you want to see the Father, look at me. That's pretty cool, isn't it? You want to know what the Father's like? Look at Jesus. They're exactly alike. So you can't have one guy up here that's out to get you. Good cop, bad cop. One guy, he's not quite equal. Down here. God the Father loves you so much so that literally God the Son, God the Son literally through the will of God the Father willingly became sin and died. Why? So He wouldn't have to punish you. That's what I used to think. No. So that sin would die. Sin died in Christ on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin so that you might become the righteousness of God in Him. Some people say you have an old nature. Some people say you have two natures. You have the nature of the flesh and you have the nature of God, you know, and you know, there's a war going, fighting going. No, no. You have one nature. You have the same nature as God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. They've given you this nature. That's why that, that just like with Paul, it's hard for us to kick against the goat. It's hard. Grace to you for all. Peace. Grace and peace. And then he says, who gave himself for our sins. There it is. There it is. He gave himself for because of our sins. What does that mean? That means in Christ, sin died. When Christ died, you died. So you died to sin. When Christ was buried, you were buried. And when Christ was raised to walk in newness of life, you were raised to walk in newness of life. Some people don't know it. Others don't believe it. Then he goes on to say, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. And we're going to talk about that according to the will of God, our father. Now, I talked about this last week, the present evil age. So these people that he's writing to were Jewish believers. Okay? They were Christians that had come out of the Jewish faith, most of them. And they were mixing law and grace. Folks, the evil age that he's talking about right here, it's not the Romans. You expect unbelievers to act like unbelievers, but he's writing to the, to the Christian Jews. This present evil age, you know what evil what it is? It's saying that you have a hand in your own salvation. That how God feels about you is determined by what you do. That's evil. That's eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's eating from the same tree that Adam and Eve ate from. He wants to take us out of that, out of that evil age, according to the will of God and our God and Father. It's the Father that wants to do this. He doesn't want to straighten you out. He wants you to know how He feels about you and what it is that He's done. And then He says, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. Do you see this? This is the message of grace. Now, there's not another message from God. There isn't another message from God. I said a minute ago that God pours out His wrath on everyone. Mm -hmm. He does. I used to think God, you know, we think of the, in Western theology today. And by the way, we are the Johnny come lately, the Western theologians. We are. In Western theology, we say that there's the love of God and there's the wrath of God. And boy, you don't want the second one. But when you understand what the word wrath means, it literally means strong emotion. We've turned it into anger. The word is or, or gay. Huh. Let you think. Strong emotion. You see, when he pours out his strong emotion on those that have believed and received this love that he has 
They're overcome by the love of God. But when somebody doesn't want it and is rebelling against it, it's torment. But it's the same love. God never changes. He doesn't. He's always been loved from the beginning. And then he talks about the perversion of the gospel. And he's going to call names. In the book of Galatians, I mean he calls names. He talked about Peter. He talked about, he said, even Barnabas has, has been taken in by this. He talked about James, the Lord's brother. So this is one of the ways we know this was before the Jerusalem Council. James was pastor of the church at Jerusalem. And he bought in. He said, boy, I was wrong. This is what he's sharing is right. He called in basically the big three here. He says in verse 6, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. A different gospel. You know what he... <laughs> I'm going to call it the garden gospel. Because Adam and Eve believed that their relationship with the one who created them, the one who they walked with every day, personal, face to face, the one who they spent daily time with, they believed a lie that they had to do something to be like him. They believed Satan's lie. It's the same lie that people are believing today. He said, I'm amazed you're so quickly deserting the grace of Christ. Whew. For a different gospel. And then he says in verse 7, which is not really, I'm sorry, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and who want to distort the gospel of Christ. He said there's not another gospel. There's not another. They want to distort the gospel of Christ. Distort. Keep you from seeing it. You know, we call that camouflage. You know, you can hide something in plain sight with camouflage. That's what's happening here. They're hiding in plain sight what it is that, that Christ has done. What it is that God the Father, who from the beginning, from before time existed, loved you and chose you. And He chose you holy, it says in Colossians 3.12. You were chosen holy, set apart. We're going to see some things. God the Father literally in the person of God the Son died to sin. And when He died, you died. The Bible says when one died, all died. The one is Jesus. The all is you and everyone else. And it says in Romans 6, 4, when He was raised, you were raised to walk in newness of life. That was His plan. And it was all Him. Romans 5, I've gone through this so many times. You were, you were justified by His blood. Had nothing to do with you. We see another place, by His life. I mean, by His, uh, by his faith. His faith. You were reconciled while you were an enemy. And you were saved by His life. Doesn't say you were saved by the prayer. It says you were saved by His life. That's what it says. Now, do you need to believe it? Yes. You know, when you receive a gift, that gift from your perspective becomes yours, but it was already yours, but you hadn't received it. Well, the gift was given. As far as God the Father was concerned, it was yours. But there's no benefit unless you believe it. Am I saying that all are going to believe? No. I wish they would. You know, I would certainly like for that to be the case. Some people say, well, that's not right. Really? So it was right that, that you believed? You say, yeah, but I believed. They haven't. Really? So, so you're God and you know? You know, God's will is that He loves folks, period. Yeah, but that guy's really bad. Oh, unlike me, unlike you. The Bible said, you know, Jesus said, if you've thought it. It's the same thing. You say, well, I've never killed anybody. Jesus said, anger is the same as murder. You say, I've never committed adultery on my wife. The Bible says, you've lusted. It's the same thing. 
people say, well, I've never lied. (laughs) Well, you just did. (laughs) You get my point. None of us deserve anything. But He loves us. You'll never run into anybody that God doesn't love. Then Paul goes on to say, but if we or an angel from heaven should preach, should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. This is the strongest statement that Paul can make. I don't think he wants that to be the case because he was one of the ones preaching a different gospel. But he's straightening it out. Now, if they're preaching a different gospel, where is that gospel coming from? It's coming from the enemy. Think about that. You know, the message is that I preached for years, for years. This is what you do. I would say, there's nothing you can do to be saved. God did it all. Now, here's what you do. And then I would tell them what to do. You need to pray. You need to believe. You need to just pray after me. That's what I used to do. Pray after me. I will lead you. And then I'd get them to say the words. Then I would say, now, where is Christ in relation to you? If they did it right, they'd say, he's in my heart. And I'd say, amen, praise God. Because Christ being in your heart or not was all up to you. And it was kind of up to me too, because I'm the one who told you. That's what I used to preach. (laughs) I'll tell you a funny story. We had four children. We were living in Bogart, Georgia, right outside of Athens. And it was the year, my, it was my year of living normally. <laughs> it was my year between pastoring. Thought we were going to go down to Brazil, Willie. And uh, we were going to go to Sao Paulo, Brazil. And the Lord, that door was closed. It's another story. But we had a 10 passenger LTD station wagon. And a friend of mine gave it to me because one of my dear friends, because he wanted a carpool. I had a bunch of kids and he had even more than I did. He had six, we had four. So we needed a big car and it had seats in the back. You know, you've seen those station wagons with seats in the back. And that thing would seat three, six, four. It would seat 10 people, two of them. It had two facing each other in the back so we could put a pile of kids in there. And everybody had a seatbelt. That was the crazy part about it. But, uh, Johnny and I were coming from someplace. I didn't even know where we'd been. The kids were in the back. They liked to ride in the back. So we had Peter, the oldest, David, the second one, and Stephen, the youngest. Stephen was really young. How old was Stephen then? Probably four? Four, yeah. Three. He was three. And so Peter's going to lead him to the Lord. We're listening. And so he gave him the plan of salvation, quote unquote. And then he led him in prayer. He'd heard me do it. I mean, he was perfect. And then... <laughs> He said to Stephen, now where's Jesus now in relation to you? And Stephen goes, under the seat? (laughs) I almost had to pull the car off on the side of the road. (laughs) I was laughing so hard. Oh my goodness. Under the seat? (laughs) He's right here with us. He's under the seat. He wasn't trying to be funny. But you know, kids say the funniest things, but what was really sad is, it's kind of how we do it today. It's exactly what we do. And all Peter was doing was just telling people what he'd heard me say. You know, at that time, it really didn't pierce me at that time like it does now. Now I will tell people, hey, Jesus loves you. You say, do you tell them anything else? Mm, no, not really. Why? You don't tell them the full gospel. Uh, yeah, I do. He died. He became sin. He died. I died in Him. When He was raised, I was raised. I have been chosen by God from before time existed. And I was chosen already holy, set apart, to be loved by Him. That is the gospel. You say, what happens when you tell people that? They're going to get false hope. I hear that. It just makes me sick. No, they're not going to get false hope. They're going to believe it. You say, but what if their lives don't change? They do. Yours did. And they believe it. And then they want to share 
the good news with others. And they do. This was the early church. If you go back to read the early church fathers, this is the message. Not what we do today. But he said if an angel or somebody from heaven, quote unquote, tells you a different message, by the way, they won't. What he's saying right here, this is a false angel. What do we call those? We call those demons. They're to be accursed. He's not saying curse that person. Let me tell you something. Curse the message. The message is not from heaven. And he says in verse 9, And as we have said before, I, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Wow. Received. You know, when something is received, you receive a gift. A gift given. You can only receive what's been given. It's already been given. You've taken it. You've received it as your own. As the old saying goes, you've owned it. You wear it. It's yours. He said this twice in two verses. Boom, boom. He's making a point. In the very beginning, he's making a point. And he's going to spend the rest of this whole letter talking about it. Verse 10, new, chap, new uh, paragraph. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Now let me tell you what a bondservant is. A bondservant is somebody who was a slave, was set free, but loves the master so much, he chose to remain with the master. We've seen that from from throughout time. He now sees himself as a son. Paul does. Before that time, he saw himself as a slave. Another word for slave is a servant. I just want to be a servant of God. I just want to be a servant. Oh, sounds so spiritual. Now, no, you don't. You want to be a son because that's who you are. Now, will a son serve? Yes. We were talking about somebody this morning. You know, our friend. You know, the one that he likes me better than me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a standing joke. He likes everybody. This guy looks like Jesus. He really does. And he called me. I said, call me, Craig. He said, I just can't. It's pastor. I'm talking about you, Travis. And Travis has told me more than once. He says, I just like to I just like to serve people. He said, I just like it. That's what he wants to do. You know, that's pretty cool. Reminds me of Jesus. Now, I believe that's his spiritual gift. I really do. The guy is amazing. I've got a son that, that's his spiritual gift. Others, you know, one I believe has the gift of administration. I, one has the gift of uh, David. He's always been somebody that helped people. I mean, he's, you know, from the time he was a little boy, you can look back and you can see this. My daughter, bless her heart. <laughs> oh my goodness, she's like me. She's a prophet. You don't need many prophets, folks. <laughs> you need somebody with a gift of mercy to go with a prophet, I can tell you right now. But Paul, he's not trying to please men. He's a bondservant. He knows Jesus loves him and he loves him back. And he says in verse 11, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. There is no part of the gospel that's according to man. None whatsoever. None of it. Not what you do. Not what anyone does. It's not according to man. Oh, man. He says in, in verse 13, uh, let me read 12 first. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Nothing has changed. Now, I'm not against study. Certainly not against reading the Bible, not against studying the Bible. It's amazing. As I look back with what God has shown me in my spirit about who He is, I go back to the Word and I read the, Bi or the Bible. I go back to the Bible and I read it with the Word interpreting the Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Jesus is the word, but he's given us his mind. It's the spirit who energizes us and gives us the mind of Christ. And so when I read the Bible with the mind of the word, I see things I never saw before. And what I thought it was saying, I now look and I say, how did I miss this? How did I miss it? He says, I neither received it from man nor as I taught it from man but through a revelation of Jesus Christ. God reveals this to you. This is not taught. Now, there's nothing wrong with teachers. I believe I am one. But this is revealed, revealed to you through Jesus Christ. In verse 13, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. That's what he did. He would track Christians down, true Christians, and he would harm them, or in some cases, kill them. Stephen was one of the ones we know about. And he said, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. He was zealous for his traditions. Now, verse 15. But when God who had set me apart even from my mother's womb. You know what set apart means? It's one of the words that means holy. It's the word saint. Look at this. When God who had declared me a saint from my mother's womb. What part of that was Paul's part? He didn't even go by the name Paul then. He was Saul. He had nothing to do with any of this. And he lived a terrible life. Now, he thought he was living a good life. He was living according to the traditions, the ancestral traditions. We could say the traditions of the church. I've seen people get into it. Now, with my background, being Baptist, I'm, I'm sure most of them wouldn't claim me now. That's fine. But when people would hear something that they don't believe, you know what they would say? I've heard this more than once. Oh, many, many times. They would say, that's not Baptist. Now I would say, well, I hope not. You say, well, you saying Baptists are wrong? No. I'm just saying the traditions of man are wrong. It's what Paul was dealing with. I want to read you Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. I'm reading this before we get into verse 16. I was just reading this verse this morning and I thought, good night. And I read it in the English and I said, that's not right. Then I looked it up in the Greek and sure enough, let me read it to you the way it was written in the, in the English. To them God has chosen to make known, aorist tense, completed action, once and for all, one time. Once it's been made known, then it cannot be unmade, once they know it. To them God has chosen, God's the one who chose, to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says it. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's wonderful. And it is the truth. And it is the mystery. Christ in you. He's going to make it known among the Gentiles. That means somebody's going to tell them. Somebody's going to come into the Gentiles and he's going to tell them what God will do if they do this. And I read that and I thought, Lord, I didn't write. And I looked it up and I knew what word among was. I knew what it was. And when I looked at it, I knew it was going to be this and it was. Listen to this. Let me read it to you the way the Greek says it. To them God has chosen to make known completed action once and for all in the Gentiles. The word is en in the Greek. It's the same word you Spanish speakers. We have people watching in Latin America that speak English. Mi español es muy malo. To make known in the Gentiles, his present position, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you. Christ in who? Who are we talking about here? Who are we talking about here? We're talking about, what word did he use? What group is he talking about? Gentiles. The Gentiles. You know what this word means? Nations. To make known in the nations 
You say, well, it's just play on words. It's semantics. No, it's not. Because he goes on to explain it, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's telling them what Christ has already done. Paul says here, he did it from his mother's womb, who set me apart even from my mother's womb, called me through his grace, was pleased, look at this, to reveal his son in me. He says that in the English. He was when he was pleased to reveal his son in me. Now in the meantime, Paul had done some wicked, terrible things. But at the proper time, God revealed his son in Paul. Paul was a bad guy. Paul was killing Christians. He was tracking Christians down, torturing and killing Christians. And it pleased God to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him. And here we go. It says it here too so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I'm going to go among the Gentiles and I'm going to preach Jesus. But that's not what this says. This word among, it's the word in. He revealed his son in me so that I might preach him in the Gentiles. I'm going to tell them that Christ has already given them his life. Now, they're my friends. I love these guys. Some of my former, still my friends. I think that they may not. They say, I just can't, I can't go there. This past couple of weeks, been talking about this with a friend. Can't go there. Can't go there. You're saying Christ is in everybody. Nope. That's not what I'm saying. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. You say, well, no, that's not right. Really? I didn't write it. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Boy, that's a good thing too, isn't it? Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. And I'm just going to read this next verse and we'll pick it up in the same verse next time. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. Let me stop. After God revealed these truths to Paul, Changed his name from Saul to Paul. And then for three years in Arabia, in the desert, I believe he spent three years with the person of Christ. You say, how did he do that? Hey, Christ is Christ. He can do whatever he wants. The apostles spent three years with him. Paul spent three years with him. After three years, I didn't go to Jerusalem. Tell him what God had shown me. I didn't do that. I spent three years being discipled. Now, how did he do that? That's his call. Then I went to Jerusalem three years later. Then I began to share with Peter. And you know what? Peter believed it. Now, Peter went away. But he came back. If you don't believe me, read First and Second Peter. You'll see he ended up where Paul was. So we're going to pick this up next time. If you didn't pick up anything from this but this, remember this. It's not about you. It's about Him. Just like in, in, in Colossians 1.27. Colossians 1.27. In the Gentiles. Who is Christ in you. The Gentiles. You Gentiles. The hope of glory. That's where He is. Believe it. Receive it as your own. You know, my father gave me a lot of things. You know, mostly what he gave me, he gave me life. My mother gave me life too, of course. But I'm just going to use my father because I have his name. And I was not born a servant. I was born a son. Now, growing up in our household, I guarantee you, I cut grass. We did dishes. We cleaned our own bedroom. We had chores. We did them. And we didn't do them. We were in trouble. The wrath of Ed and Mary was on you. Why? Because they didn't love me. No. Wrong. You know, I was in the same household they were. Why should they have to do all the work? I was a son. But I served. And you see, I didn't get this one day. I didn't get this when I believed it. It was already mine. Now, there are people today that literally don't 
They don't even know they're sons or they don't act like sons or they don't think they're worthy of being called a son. When I'm saying son, I'm talking about a child. They don't think they're worthy just like the, just like the, uh, the prodigal. And he said, I'm not worthy to be called a son. Just let me be a slave. And the father just said, Shh. he said, go get the best robe, the robe of righteousness from the father's house. Go get my best robe, put it on him. He said, bring the ring, put the ring on his finger, the ring of authority. That's what that meant. Put the sandals on his feet. Wherever you go, the righteousness and the authority goes with you. Nothing's changed.